but I have to know, USM have to know what are the issues. If you got it, coming back to the Ptolemy record, there is a record that mentioned the Strait of Malacca was used much earlier in the BC period. So my question is why the earlier researcher not on the BC sites. Where is the site during the BC period if Strait of Malacca was used much earlier? So I'm using the radar image, the uh, satellite image, the remote sensing. Uh, at, in 2007, I just want to know, in the year 1 of AD, Tahun Satu Masih, where is the sea level? I'm using that data to know whether there is a correlation between the sea level during that period with the civilization evidence. So this is some picture that gave me a clue that during the first year, the first year of AD, the sea levels is up about 2 meters and enter the land in that area about 7 kilometers. So this clue gives us an answer that the all of the 87 sites during the first year of AD still under the water or in the swampy area. So I went straight to Singabatu because this area during the first year of AD just nearby the sea. It's true that when we went there in 2007, very a lot of the bricks are already on the surface and a lot of iron slags on the surface. Because this area, this sites of Singabatu, they change from jungle to rubber estate and then to the old palm estate. They already bulldoze about one meter of the top soil. So this, the culture layer is very near to the surface. You just dig up about two, uh, five inch to eight inch, you already arrive at the culture layer. So that's the new site, Tapak Baru, uh, quite inland yeah, uh, compared to the other sites, the 87 sites. So this is the reconstruction of the sea level. Uh, the first one is from uh, 1st to 3rd century. So Singapatu is here. Yeah. So 4th to 10th century. So more land compared to the first one more and more and after 14th century is until today it's become like this. So Sunabatu just at the sides of the sea level. This is how we use the scientific technique to know from the Pali environment reconstruction where is the old sites, the ancient sites of Kadatua. So we went straight to the area the road that you crossed yesterday or today uh, just built in 2007, just finished and we found mound and mounds in that area. Mounds mean the small hill that the site itself. So we mapped about in 2007, 97 sites in 4 square kilometers. Another extra site, 87 sites mentioned by Jen Allen in 400 square kilometer. This one, another 97 sites in just 4 square kilometer. So, it really show, it really represent the complex of civilization. The real things come out. This all the 97 sites we found and we mapped in 2007. And then, we informed uh, the Department of Heritage that this is the area that we can get more data to, com to complete the Bujang Valley evidence. So we got the license from Heritage Department in 2009, 2009 and we start research uh, in February 2009. As you know, archaeological research start with the uh, geophysics to locate where is the site, what is the underground, what actually underground, and then we start to put in the trenches 
and start the excavation layer by layer uh, to see the cultural evidence. Yeah. So in 2009, this is a picture we involved the local about more than 100 percent of the local level, and also our USM staff and student, uh, heritage department staff, and also the museum staff involved in the first 2009 excavation. After nine years, until today, we already excavated 52 sites out of 97 sites. And we already found four functions. The ritual sites, the river jetty is part of the port, the iron smelting, the heavy industry, and also the administrative building for the port. Only four function that we know from the 52 sites. There are more, a lot of more sites to be estimated in the future. And the dating that we got from these four function, from 52 sites, the sites was used from 535 BC until 17th century AD. Continuous use from time to time about 200, 2600 years. So, the 535 BC evidence came from the iron smelting industry workshop. You all know when we talk about, when we discuss about iron smelting, for sure there are remains of charcoal and ash. Okay? So this charcoal is very important and as a material that can give a dating of the site of artifacts. So the iron smelting 535 BC. How do you know this workshop is iron smelting? What are the evidence you found to prove it as you was used as our iron workshop? First, for sure, they must have the iron ore, BGBC. Yeah. They must have the material, the source. So, our question where they get it? the iron ore. So after mapping the whole area and from the ge geological map that was mapped since 1966, the whole area full of iron ore. So all around Mount Ojra is a lot of iron ore. Anybody knows UITM Marbo? Underneath the UITM Marbo all with iron ore. Anybody from UITM who want to become a quarry manager? <laughs> so it's really a lot, the iron ore. No problem at all for this industry to be on. Okay? So the second one, to smell the iron, needs 1,200 degrees Celsius. At least. So it's not involved with open firing. They must have the finish. They're allowed. I want to definitely go. So they must have this. What they call a finish. Then the finish need the bellow. To make sure the temperature in the finish will be up until 1000 degrees Celsius. So they perlukan pump angin, what we call the bellow, or archaeological words, the tuya. Okay, they need these three tools, and all these three tools we found in Sungai Batu, in every site that really showed the function as a iron smelting workshop. Okay, as you can see. Here, the iron ore, hematite, and magnetite, majority. Okay. 
The second one, the furnish, but in Sunan Batu, we only found the base of the furnish because they broke the furnish to get the iron ore from the furnish. But 40 kilometer from Sungai Batu, we found more than 10 sites with the intact furnish. Very clear. And then you must have the two year. The two year is the French words because they found first in, in French. So, as I already mentioned, some of the words because it is found first in France, only about 20 pieces, but in Sungabatu, you can go to the site and see more than 2 million of two years. You just imagine how busy this industry with 2 million of two years. The storage of two years in the world only found in Sungabatu. Then the smelting process starts. They must put it, mix the iron ore in the finish with sand and lime, and for sure the charcoal, the woods, so that the irons become really strong compared to the original material. Yeah. Because of the process of the iron smelting, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of ash and charcoal in every site that we excavate. So the charcoal is very important where we can know what type of species of tree they use as charcoal, as aram, and also we know we can use the charcoal for the thing, to know the tree, the tare. And then what type of product after the smelting? Did they produce the knife? Did they produce the sword? Did they produce the chariot or anything regarding the final product of the iron? But nothing there. Only very few knives that I think is more to the personal item to the workers. What we found is more like this. This pieces that I thought at first it just an iron slag. Because if they produce the ingot, automatically, I think the same with you all in mind when we talk about ingot, it's a perfect uh, rectangular things. So I'm doing the comparison throughout the year that this is actually at least the big size to the finger size is the ingot during that period at the early stage. So this one of the workshop of the iron smelting, the round yellow, the white one is the ash, represent the third century AD. So this workshop SB2A, the site of SB2A, they're using the sites from third century AD to eight century AD, 500 years doing their works in this area. In this site, just this site. So this, the base, the remains of the base of the furnish in the site. Because the top one is already the broke to get the iron ore inside, the iron uh, ingot inside. Uh, this is the storage of two years. The round shape panel that they use to the wall of the furnish. Millions of two years on the side. This is another example of two years. It's about eight inch. There is a small hole at the center that allowed them to pump in the air. And the small hole, the standard division is 0 0.01. You just imagine what type of mold they use from 5 to 5 BC. What type of technology they use. How they control uh, the product with the same shape, with the same size. This is the location, uh, Sungai Batu, and 
this area we found the intact uh, finish. This is the intact finish in the in situ location. So you can see the two year yeah, in the wall of finish. Two year, two year, two year. So for each one, each finish with one meter height and one meter the diameter needs about five to ten two year for each one in one process. So the material of two year and material of finish all from clay. So from all the iron smelting site, we know what type of iron ore they use. We know from where they got the iron ore, the straw material. And then from the excavation, we know the break into small pieces and the roasted process happened in every train, in every sites of the cemetery. And in the finish, they put in the sand plus wood and plus lime and the product ingot and iron slag with the temperature 1200 degrees Celsius. So we know the technology, we know the focus work, we know the sterilization and for sure, this involves a very high social hierarchy. Very high. How you want to control the level, how you want to control the geologist to know where is the iron to import, to quarry, and for me, at least at one period of time, at least 10,000 people in this area. At least. Okay, uh, to see the quality of the iron, uh, Iron slags, iron ingot uh, from the SRR division. SRR analysis very clear, very good material of iron, more than 70% of ferro for each ingot that we analyze. So the quality is very, very good. Now I want to know because no record in the Malaysian history book record that mentioned Malaysia or Malaya during, during that period or Kedatua during that period, the ancient kingdom during that period, export iron. We only know during that period, our country well known in terms of gold and tea, Suwarna Bumi and the others. So, because no record, we have to start to read and to find evidence on the writing records. So these some sort of writing record that we already found. In the Changkam period, during 200 BC to 200 AD, in the south of India, they import the iron from Kataram. And after more detailed study, the Kataram, the root words of Kaz, K-A-Z-H, means the black iron. And during the 10th century, very clearly import the iron to make a chariot, the iron import from Kataram. The same, the root word means the black iron. And Al-Kindi and Al-Biruni, the Islamic record, mentioned the best iron in the world came from Yemen, Kala, for the Kedah tour, and Hindi. And I Ching in the 7th century AD recorded Three finger size that you already see on the uh, one of the PowerPoint, he will get five coconuts from one ingot, one iron slab. In the traveling, he's traveling from Chia Chia in China, uh, means also uh, the black iron to India to learn about Hindu Buddhist. He stopped by in the Koba Island and then the Koba Island, you know the Koba Island until today is still naked. <coughs> During 7th century AD needs the iron to make their own knife. It's recorded. And Kataha in the Sanskrit, that's the lingua franca throughout this region, at least during the first year of AD, uh, means the bowl of iron. So we are the storage of iron for the world. And we found the iron smelting site. That's some of the evidence 
yet we found. So throughout the region, the world, you can see how important Bedah Tua Sungai Batu for the world civilization period. Now I'm going to the monument, the, evi the evidence of monument that I can divide into three regarding the function, the ritual, the special monument, the ritual, uh, the river jetties, part of the port, and also the shafanda of the port, the administrative building for the port. So we already found three type of function, uh, monuments, special monuments that they produce. This is an example. Yeah. At the beginning of the research, it's very difficult for us because if I compare my experience with the Angkor, my experience with Borobudur, Majibitu, Maya, all the others, very clear, at least three to four kilometers away, you can see the structure of Angkor. The very clear structure of Borobudur. Yeah. Very clear structure of pyramid in Maya, pyramid in uh, Egypt. Yeah. Very clear structures, ziggurats in Mesopotamia, but we only found the base building, the floor, the lantai, and some wall, not more than two feet. But very clear arrangement that we can see uh, from the floor. They change from one direction, then they change. It become a wall, part of the wall. You can see the rooms inside the building. Yeah. So this is the wall, one wall. This is the opposition wall. So this one room during that period. So at the beginning, very difficult because you, you had to see from the top. Yeah. So my student asked me, Prof, fungsinya apa ni? Dah sebulan dah ni kita. Tak tahu apa dia. So it's very difficult at the beginning. So this is another arrangement of the bricks that you can see uh, horizontal bricks, every two layer, then the gap, then every another two bricks or layer. So this is how we work. This and this is already nine years. Not even single day holiday until today. So we found the stage, the step, we found the pillar, the bricks pillar, we found the floor and also the wall. And we know the technology. So the bricks made from the clay around that area, very good clay, the kaolin and also the mon moraranite, plus the sand and others. We know the temperature of the bricks, they produce 400 to 300 degrees Celsius. We know the cements, they're using the mud and also sums with the resins, the dama. And the base of all the building, they're using the lead dry. And surprisingly, sangat memeranjatkan. They have the roof tiles during the BC period. You just imagine the village kampung during 70s, 80s, is still using the nipa as item. But this period, they already have the roof tiles, and we can see the evidence of Pila. Yeah. So now, uh, the yellow color represents the jetty at both sides of the river. Yeah. That really represents, because so many uh, jetties, so many platforms, both sides of the river, the river so it really represents the port. And you can see how busy during that period of this port, that involved the, with the iron. So this is the architecture of the river uh, jetty. They're using the floor, the arrange the brick, every two bricks for one layer, then a gap, then every two bricks, then a gap. So when the water is level is up, it will drip between the bricks. This is the first time we found the architecture of jetty in South Asia. Very clear, all 12 jetties that we excavate shows the same architecture. So this from the other side that you can see the layer of the floor. So the, the reconstruction of the river jetty. There is a floor and a wall behind and a step and also 
round shape to pull on your ship. So this is the roof tile. I think some of you know this is the Singora roof tile. This is another material that was produced since BC. If we found first in Singabatu, it cannot be called Singora. It will be called Singabatu. <laughs> so, little bit frost on that. Because later, only later period we found this. But this is the origin of Singora. And this is the pillar base. There's a lot, so many types of pillar base. I think seven types of pillar base. Some on the bricks, some direct on the ground. Okay. This is the second monument that uh, function as a ritual with a round shape as a base and then a square 5.5 times 5.5 on the top. So, Mr. Stevens, uh, this the architect at 110 AD. So, I'm not sure your uh, groups of architects during that period. Because it's perfect, 5.5 times 5.5. Structure, all bricks. So the, the round shape dated 110 AD. Today I'm a lot of the news or the data about the years. So I hope you can imagine what is BC all about. What is AD all about. So the zero, is Nabi Isa Lahir. So the left part, BC. The right part, our Masih, our AD today. So our AD is 2016 now, this year. The other part is BC. So 110 AD, the round shape. And around this, this monument, uh, we found 12 pottery that shows a, a ritual. And the square shape dated uh, 6th century AD. So the first structure is just the round shape. Okay? Then later, at 6th century AD, they built the square shape, the square, and also the small round shape on the top. Okay? So this is the plan. So the structure here, 110 AD. And also they have a lot of uh, hall and others. Here we found the food remains, a lot of swampy area shells where we found a lot of chapel. So if we compare 110 AD to other parts of Southeast Asia, this is already the oldest monument in Southeast Asia for this one, 110 AD. So this is the construction. Eh? The shape of the monument, very special, round and square. And then we also found the Shabanda monuments of the administrative monuments for the port. So, uh, so the pink color is the port, the river jetties, and behind we found 12 monuments. Some with four rooms, some with three rooms. Some with one, only one room. So this represents uh, the administrative structure building to handle the port. Okay. For example, if you went to Langkawi, there is a called a Pedah uh, station where we can see the room of immigration, the room of customs to handle the port. Okay. So we already found this one. So this is the shape of the administrative building. Yeah. So many types of shape. And the oldest monument right now is 487 BC. This one of the monument represents the 487 BC. You see the OSL dating. So the round shape building is just 110 AD. That one also is very, very old, the Southeast Asia. But uh, we already found the 478 BC. So this the construction where we found the stays, yeah, pentas, 
on one session of the building. So kalau kita boleh reconstruct this, because we don't have very clear the compare uh, with Angkor and Borobudo, so do you, we have to play this one with, for example, with the hologram to build up so that our tourists can understand what it's all about. So this is another one, I will go fast, as another sample of the shape of the building. This represents the 3rd century BC. This is the 2nd century BC, just a square that we found in one of the sites. Uh, this is very nice, there is a step going up to the stairs on the top, 1st uh, century BC. Uh, this is the river jetty that represents the 5th century AD, see the shape. This is another river jetty on the 5th century. This is a very special one, uh, sites uh, SB2E uh, with, with the walkway or the boardwalk, very far and very nice uh, elongated positions. This is the 10th century CE, uh, the river jetty. This 5th century BC, uh, very big structure. Oh, building. Okay, this is another shape. So we will compare with the chronometric dating throughout Southeast Asia, all the evidence that really shows the Buddha ancient kingdom is the oldest and the first one in this region based on this chronometric dating. But based on today, tomorrow if you find in Cambodia much older, then we cannot see it. <laughs> You know what I mean. Eh? Uh, so in general, for sure, because uh, they export the iron, they export the ingot, they must have a very, very good, very, very high kingdom. But until today, I'm no evident what type of kingdom. Tangka suka? I'm not sure. So we have, we have to wait until we one day we know what really kingdom here. But for sure, it's very good high social hierarchy kingdom because they involved with iron because iron is the end of technology when you conquer 1200 degrees Celsius it's nothing for you bricks, sheep, it's nothing because you are already at the level of 1200 degrees Celsius so we have friends on civilization yeah, very clear Angkor around 80 yeah. uh, Vijaya that already become a uh, Akio heritage, Akio tourism product. Yeah. So, this is uh, the comparison that we can go for the uh, tourism industry and others to allow us compare and to see the constant. Okay, sorry, I'm a little bit late to show you the dating concept that I mentioned before. The 0 BC and AD. Yeah. So we have the evidence of 6th century BCE from the iron smelting, the oldest monument in Sunabatu or the old uh, ancient Buddha kingdom that represent the 5th century BC and also continues until the whole area of Babujang conquered uh, by the early people. So this ancient Buddha kingdom, iron smelting, start 6th century BC. Then we also found the evolution of religions that shows at this point they start with animism, then very clear Hindu Buddhists, all the Vimana Mandapa throughout the Bujang Valley already dated that give a date. The oldest is fifth century AD. So for sure during fifth century AD, the whole people in Bujang Valley is Hindu Buddhists. Then from the uh, the nearest uh, sultanate, uh, there are sites mentioned that 1136 is already Islam in this area. So you can see that one. And in terms of evolution of architecture, from 6th century, uh, from 5th century BC, they're all using the bricks until 5th century AD. It's about 1000 years then they know how to manipulate their electrolyte 
the rock, the granite, and also the river pebbles to build the temples around the Bujang Valley. So we answered at least three from our research, from nine years of research in this area. So if we compare throughout the regions, uh, throughout the world, then where the old Dark Kingdom will be in the old civilization in the world. So this is the map right now, 2D maps. Uh, the location of all the site, really one big complex, civilization complex. We already start excavation here. There are uh, five sunken ships in this Paleo Lake or Paleo River. This is the industry area, the ice smelting. Uh, this industry area, all with ice smelting. This is the ritual sites. This is the administrative, the Shabanda. After five years of research. So, for the whole country, as mentioned by, from Professor Stephen Oppenheimer, we have very old evidence of prehistoric in Langung, 1.83 million years. In Sabah, we have the evidence of prehistoric, 235,000 years. And I think a lot of you know about Gonya, the Nyakim, Sarawak, represent the 40,000 years. And the only evidence that really represent the early kingdom for the country is only from Pedah. The whole Pedah kingdom start from 535. So the dating, uh, we are sending the dating for organic charcoal for radio carbon and AMS to Australia, Wollong University, Japan and Beta Analytic Lab. So every sample, at least three lab to confirm the date. Yeah, I'm not playing with the date. 535 is not just from one sample, but it is from three samples from three different labs. Because in our country, not even a single lab on radio carbon. <laughs> I'm really afraid because this scientific lab is very important for the country in the future. If you go anywhere, the Negara Maju only can Maju if they have the scientific until today, not even a single scientist from Malaysia knows about what is the dating of the world. It's already 2016. Okay, for the bricks, there, there is a different technology. We call it OSL, or Thermal Illumination Dating. We send the dating to the Oxford and Washington University, Korea Basic Science Lab, and also Hiruzen Lab in Japan at least three to four lab for each sample so that we confirm all the results. So this, uh, Dr. Zarina will mention detail about the development and also this is our purpose to the, to the government. So these are some of the publication, uh, some of the media, we are already in the history channel two years ago, the Sungabatu. So this is the mouth of Sungabatu in Mago. And propose to the government uh, so that this area we have a light and some show on the Marum Mawansa enter to the Mabo with the two year as a symbol of the entrance. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dato Dr. Mutasaidi. Uh, now, I would like to invite Dr. Zainal Ibrahim, Department of National Heritage, for keynote number two, Kedatua Roads to UNESCO World Heritage.
I'm so sorry, but I have to make you to wait for a while to listen to this because this is very important because we need all the support from the stakeholders for us to bring this up to the international level. Okay. After listening to what uh, Prof. Mokta has, you know, talked about the roles and contributions of Sungai Batu in the world civilization context, I think it is pertinent. Next, please, for us to actually uh, bring forward what is here in Sungai Batu to the international uh, arena. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the next, please. Under the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural uh, Heritage 1972, Malaysia has ratified it in 1988. Being one of the members of the state parties, Malaysia became a member of the World Heritage Committee for the first time in 2011 till 2015, a six-year term. Okay? And one of our main tasks was to actually evaluate and ident identify what is relevant and important to be inscribed. You know, nominations come to us and we will evaluate it. So uh, now we have ended our term and of course uh, uh, being the, the Department of National Heritage is the uh, focal point representing Malaysia as the uh, one of the state parties in the uh, convention. Okay. Um, in, in order for us to put up our nomination, usually what UNESCO would consider is actually the inscription sites or natural and cultural heritage properties.